Just 36 months later, Scotland had its new breathtaking bridge. Concrete and steel blending beautifully into its surroundings, creating a connection to the mainland. A remarkable feat of engineering given that the team battled daily with gale force winds and freezing temperatures. The weather was one of our biggest challenges, both in terms of waves and in terms of, uh, of rain and snow and sleet. It comes at you and you just have to keep on, on going. You've got a weekly cycle which you, which you want to meet. The bridge was completed and opened on the 16th of October 1995. But with it came the toll charges. Public opposition to the fees threatened to overshadow this great engineering achievement. The local newspaper even ran a campaign to abolish them. On the very evening that it opened, there was a, a campaign of opposition, a protest on the bridge, people refusing to pay the tolls, trying to drive through without paying. Several people were arrested, including a local councillor. I wasn't personally annoyed by this uh, protest at all because I'd been involved in the project since the very, very first day. And fundamentally, we always had the feeling that the, the local population wanted to have the bridge, but understandably, they didn't want to pay for it. And the protests continued right through the entire uh, period. And at the end of the day, a political decision was made to buy the bridge back. Despite massive opposition, the toll scheme was in place for nearly a decade. But in 2004, after years of campaigning, the people of Skye successfully got the tolls abolished. As well as being beneficial for residents, the new bridge has had a huge impact on tourism. When the bridge was first opened, the traffic was around about 600,000 vehicles a year. We now know that last year it carried 1,342,000 vehicles, so therefore it's more than doubled in 15 years. And the volume of traffic, I think, can be equated to the amount of activity there is on the island. And if you drive onto the island and go up to Portree, it certainly looks as though the economy is doing fairly well, and hopefully it's a, as a result of the bridge. There's no doubt that the coming of the bridge has overall improved life, improved communications, getting people to hospital in an emergency. The ferries were always, they were a kind of romantic thing, but there were also a, a restriction on your ability to travel, and the bridge has made a big, big difference to that. As the Isle of Skye is considered to be a romantic destination, popular for its beauty and remote location, some people were concerned that by becoming connected to the mainland, they would lose their identity. I think it's understandable that the residents of an island like Skye will feel uneasy about the arrival of a, of a bridge. It changes the relationship with the mainland in a, in a very significant way. I think it's mainly about you know, natural resistance to change of any kind, however that might be, and that in time the bridge will become as comfortable to them as other parts of their natural surroundings. And it may take a generation for that change really to have worked its way through, but in time, in time it will. Sky will always be an island. It, it feels like an island. It looks like an island. It's surrounded by water. It just happens to have this bridge linking it. I think we're forever looking for innovation and design. Bridge engineers are no different to others. They push the boundaries, but at the end of the day, what we do as bridge engineers is try to balance out engineering efficiency with functionality, cost and aesthetics and hopefully most of the times we get that right and I, I would like to think that with Skybridge we did get that right. It's a very beautiful island. We, we are very careful about conservation and preservation. Not just to preserve the past but also to build something for future generations. London's Millennium Bridge is the first new crossing over the River Thames for more than a century. The result of an international competition in 1996, the aim of the bridge was to regenerate the south bank of the river and 200 entrants competed to build it. Deceptively simple looking, this 325 meter long and four meter wide steel blade appears to defy the laws of physics with this extraordinarily low suspension structure whose cables run alongside the deck rather than above it, absorbing a staggering 3,000 tons of force. It became notorious for an unexpected wobble when it first opened, but has since enabled more than 10 million people a year to get from the city of London to the South Bank. 
It is the first pedestrian-only walkway across the River Thames. It's the idea of lightness to push the technology, the materials, in the quest for something which is truly beautiful, very delicate, looks as though it's almost dancing across the landscape. That was the challenge. When we were designing it, we came over to the site and had a look. And one of the interesting things about the site is on the north side, there's a, a corridor, effectively, a straight uh, a pedestrian walkway, which goes right up to St Paul's. So our first decision is that we wanted our bridge to come straight out of that connection. And that means that when you stand on the bridge, you look all the way to St Paul's. And a lot of the bridges didn't do that. They actually zigzagged across the river or they stopped in front of underneath the Tate chimney. The team's bold design was a controversial one. Everybody said you can't go on the axis of St Paul's, that's sacrilegious. You should take a diagonal. Why take a diagonal? The shortest distance. And also, by being very quiet about the bridge, by demonstrating that it doesn't have to have any great mast. This is a pedestrian bridge, completely different loads. So it's like a blade, very, very taut, almost like a tensile elastic band. We wanted people to be able to stand on the bridge and look around them and have a view completely unimpeded by structure. We drew two banks and we said, well, what we really want to do is do a line between them. That's our bridge. And we got stuck on that. We just loved it. And I have to say, I think that in some ways it was a stroke of luck because it meets the brief quite well in that we're in a very, very dense part of the centre of London. We have to fit a bridge in a slot between the very busy navigation channel underneath, which we mustn't go into with our structure, and the protected views of St Paul's Cathedral above, which we mustn't go into. So our bridge almost fits exactly in the only location you can, you can put it. Beating the critics and the competition, the British designers finally won over with an innovative solution. The bridge is a very shallow suspension structure. So what it is is two sets of steel cables on either side of the bridge pulled very tight and anchored in each bank. And uh, there are huge foundations underneath the bridge. And that's it. Those cables provide all of the strength and stiffness that hold the bridge deck up. Completely different architecture results from that because we're using the shape of those cables pretty much as the aesthetic of the bridge, pretty much as the structure of the bridge. It was the lightest, the most technologically innovative idea from what the ones that were on offer. The construction of a bridge over a busy navigation channel is an enormous challenge. The shallow design creates huge anchorage forces at both ends, so very solid foundation piles were needed. Colossal concrete abutments or end supports were cast on top of these piles by drilling through the riverbanks to the Thames bedrock below. Then came the piers, elliptically shaped to align with the flow of the river. Cast in reinforced concrete, the pier formwork was made in three sections, each about five meters high. They were then brought by barge and put into position using cofferdams, which extracted the water from the Thames to allow the piers to be submerged. Prefabricated steel V-brackets were then fixed to the body of the piers with pre-tensioned steel bars. These were essential to support the saddles for the suspension cables. After that, they took the cables and they brought them on huge reels and pulled them over the top of the river so that they didn't get in the way of the navigation channel and then pulled them tight, jacked them into place on the north side. So they were really like a washing line that they pulled very, very tight. And then as each element of the bridge was placed onto that cable, the cable slowly sank into the final position of the bridge that we see today. Finally, the deck was laid. Aluminium was used to create the walkway to make it as light and durable as possible. Stretching an incredible 320 metres across the river, it spans more than three times the length of the pitch at Wembley Stadium. While it appears to be a simple form, the bridge is actually around six times shallower than a conventional suspension structure. The stiffness is created by the tension in the four main cables on either side, securely held through the deep end supports, which enable it to support a staggering 3,000 tonnes of horizontal force. After just 18 months and 18 million pounds, the superstructure was completed in the millennium year and opened to the public on the 10th of June 2000. An estimated 100,000 people crossed over the bridge on that day, and when they did, the unexpected happened. I was actually stood here and I was looking up at the bridge and it was wobbling by an amount that, you know, you could easily pick up by eye. It was definitely a problem and, yeah, I felt pretty miserable about it. 
bridge. I was standing on the bridge deck when this happened. So I could feel this movement beneath my feet and I could see the way people were walking in time with the bridge. And I could see their reactions and I was very disappointed. I didn't want that to happen. I am and I was very, very proud of the bridge. Uh, I'm very proud to have been a part of uh, building it and I didn't want something like this to be happening. Someone warned me. <laughs> it's true, the bridge is moving, so I came down here. I th thought it was a disaster in our hands because it, it's a highway, it's a public space, there's insurance issues. Now you can't, you know, have people falling over and injuring themselves. I mean, it's, it's not a, that was not the idea. I mean, it was, it was not a fairground <laughs> type of thing. <laughs> After only two days, the bridge was closed. Movement on bridges was not uncommon, but it was how people were adjusting their movement in time with each other that seemed to be the problem. So Arup had to go back to the drawing board to pinpoint the cause of the now infamous wobble. We've all experienced something similar when we're trying to walk on the deck of a cross-channel ferry. We tend to anticipate the way the boat is going to move and to help our balance and to help our comfort, we adjust the way we walk. The problem for the bridge engineer is that everybody does exactly the same thing. So the forces that they were generating laterally, which weren't correlated, um, suddenly they become correlated, and the significance of that effect is huge. So we ended up doing tests with crowds of people actually on the bridge. The problems involve lateral, not vertical vibration. So Arab conducted a series of tests to discover how the individual movements made by pedestrians could add up to create a total movement that was so strong. What we found was that there was a amazingly clear and well-defined relationship between the force that we exert sideways as we walk along this moving surface and the velocity, that is the speed, of that surface. And that was a sort of a eureka moment, really. The eureka moment resulted in Arup creating a completely new formula to calculate synchronous lateral excitation. That is, the sideways force that the pedestrians made as they balanced themselves to compensate for the wobble. To strengthen the bridge against this force, the team had two choices. The first was to stiffen the structure so that its frequency no longer matched the people's footsteps. But this was ruled out, both structurally and aesthetically as the bridge would have to be made at least 10 times stiffer laterally, and the additional structure needed would ruin the bridge's appearance. So they went for the second option, a method called dampening. We looked at adding damping. Dampers are like shock absorbers on your car. They dissipate energy, they absorb energy, and so a damper would absorb the energy that the pedestrians were putting into the bridge uh, and therefore uh, reduce the movement. Arup wanted to retain the elegance of the bridge's original design, but were faced with having to add a far greater amount of dampening than is normally added onto a civil structure. So they came up with a solution where dampers were arranged along the full length of the bridge underneath the deck to absorb the energy. Steel shock absorbers were also added at the base of each ramp. The team then needed to prove that it would work. We had an evening where we walked the crowd of people from the north side to the south side and then back and then back again. And the bridge behaved as predicted the movements were well underneath the uh, sill value, and after that we could open up to the public. Arab's groundbreaking discovery was shared among the global engineering community and remains an invaluable contribution to British bridge building history. The London Millennium Bridge finally reopened to the public on the 15th of January 2002. Its impact was huge, helping to regenerate the south side of the river and bring new prosperity. Certainly the bridge did help to bring more people to, to the Tate. It helped to bring more people to Bankside. So almost immediately, restaurants started appearing and cafes and, and other small galleries, and it had a big success yeah, very quickly. Cities kind of come and go, they're always regenerating because needs change, circumstances change. And the power of a bridge is part of that regeneration. It's not like a catalyst, it sort of kickstarts a process. This is the Mior Viaduct in France, one of the most famous bridges on the planet. Holding a staggering three world records, this colossal cable-stayed road bridge stretches across the deepest valley in Europe. 
no other bridge comes close to its engineering feats. It has the tallest towers, the highest pylons, and the highest road deck of any other bridge on Earth. This superstructure is longer than 20 football pitches and stands taller than the Eiffel Tower. This epic crossing connects the motorway networks of France and Spain, opening up a direct route from Paris to Barcelona. In the late 80s, the motorway was interrupted by the River Tarn Valley, which forced motorists to be funneled onto a tiny two-lane road through the village of Mior, causing queues of up to 18 miles long. The area was being destroyed by traffic. The challenge was, could you put a man-made object into a beautiful landscape and actually enhance it? The unprecedented challenge for the designers and engineers was the sheer size of the valley. Beautiful landscape presented unique problems. This gorge stretches for over a mile and is 250 meters deep. First, the French government thought the task was impossible. So much so, they actually considered tunneling through the plateaus. The geography of the region, with its deep valley and violent winds, was a huge engineering challenge. But finally, in 1987, research led by French structural engineer Michel Velojou concluded that bridging across the plateaus was in fact the best solution and a unique Anglo-French partnership to construct the world's largest bridge was born. The French state wanted the best aesthetic solution and that's why they invited architectural teams to work with engineers to find the best solution. The French administration decided that they wanted to develop five different projects. One of them was the cable state bridge with multiple spans. And it was necessary to select the architects who had to work on this option. And it was absolutely no question that it was Lord Foster to be selected for that. Because when we compared the sketches made by the different architects, the drawing by Foster was much more elegant. So for me, it was absolutely clear that he was to be the architect for this bridge. There's no illusions. You know, an architect cannot design a bridge. An engineer can. Um, the question is, this bridge was considered to be so important that they made it a legal requirement that there had to be architects as part of the team. In the end, it was a team that was completely fused. This newly assembled team of French engineers and British architects now had to work out which type of bridge would be suitable for the region. It was a philosophical decision to say, it's not a bridge over the river. The river's just, you know, you wouldn't even notice it in the landscape, in the scale of the things. The scale is about, is about the valley. And then do you want all those cables to disappear from the most important views? Or do you want to express the cables? In actual fact, you look at any photograph or you're driving across or you're looking at it from a distance, the cables disappear. If they'd been a dark color, you wouldn't see the columns. You'd just see a wall of cables against the sky. So some detail points, which seem in a way almost you know, trivial, are absolutely vital in terms of the appearance. We must make the distinction between a cable stay bridge and a suspension bridge. A suspension bridge is a bridge where the deck is supported by a primary cable draped between the tops of the towers, and then there are hanger cables from that primary cable which support the deck. Mio is a multi-span cable stay bridge. The deck is supported by direct cables which radiate from the top of the tower direct to the deck. It was clear from the beginning that the passing from plateau to plateau meant that we had to build tall piers. But I was not very anxious about that because we can build very tall chimneys or tall uh, cooling towers for nuclear plants. So I thought it was possible. We were very aware that the height of the deck was going to make it the highest road deck bridge in the whole world. So we wanted to give the drivers a sense of uh, security when they're going over it. So on the one hand, they could see the line of supports that supports the bridge so that they felt psychologically reassured that they're not just on some flying carpet, but also still could enjoy the views up to the structure and the views out to the landscape to each side. Construction began in 2001 with over 500 employees working on the site. The first challenge was the colossal piers. These had to withstand ferocious weather and support the top deck that was to weigh almost the same as two jumbo jets. 
85,000 cubic meters of concrete were used, along with precision lasers and GPS systems to ensure they were in exactly the right place. In spring 2002, the first concrete piers were built. This was a monumental part of the process, as layer upon layer of concrete was cemented together and the piers moved gradually skywards. All in all, they took two years to make, and when finally completed on the 9th of December 2003, the team broke the first of their impressive records for the tallest pier in the world at 245 meters. Next came the deck. This was a challenge in itself as it comprised 2,078 individual pieces of steel. These needed to be pieced together in stages before being edged out from both sides of the plateau until they met in the middle of the valley. On the 25th of March 2003, the first section of deck, the length of almost two football pitches, was lifted using a colossal jacking system, which slid out into the air. Lifted from both sides, these sections also contained the first pylons with the cable stays attached that came to rest in the center of the bridge. The way that the Mio Vada was built is remarkable in many ways. One of the most interesting parts was how it was built with the deck being assembled together on the land, on the plateau to one side, or to each side in fact, and then it was progressively pushed out using computer-controlled hydraulic jacks, which lifted it up, aged it along, put it down, came back, lifted it up, and you had jacks doing this process on top of each of the pier tops. 18 sliding operations took place before one of the most nerve-wracking stages, the junction. On the 28th of May 2004, the two decks successfully met in the middle, creating the structure's second world record for the highest road bridge deck in Europe, an eye-wateringly high 270 meters above the River Tarn. With the two central pylons already in place, the remaining five were transported by self-propelled trailers. The contractors then erected the pylons meter by meter using a hydraulic telescopic system, lifting them to the base of the concrete piers. These huge steel arms were also used to lift the bridge's third record, the central towers, each between 87 and 163 meters tall. Once the pylons were in place, the cable stays could be installed to support the deck. 11 pairs of these were fitted face to face on each pylon. Inside the 154 protective shrouds covering the cables lay several dozen steel strands holding them in tension. These were to take the weight of 36,000 tons, three and a half times the weight of the Eiffel Tower. Finally, the team laid the road surface. While it took less than four days to lay it across the 2,460 meters of deck, months of research ensured that it was both strong enough to resist any distortion of the deck and smooth enough to provide a comfortable ride for the public driving over it. At last, on the 16th of December 2004, a mere three years and 315 million euros later, the Mior Bridge stood complete. This was a big story and you suddenly get the context of the project within France. It's of national importance. This opening day was something uh, terrific in fact, because there were thousands of persons the television coming from Vietnam, Colombia, everywhere in the world. The biggest shock is when the president, Chirac, came and he get out of the car and he said, ah, and that was really fantastic. We were very aware at the start of the project how a lot of people in the town of Mio didn't want the idea of some big bridge appearing, you know, just in their backyard, as it were. And as it got closer to completion, all that opposition slowly evaporated as people were won over by the design. And by, by the finish, it was virtually it was no opposition at all. In fact, the people of Mio had embraced the bridge as their own and uh, it was seen as very much as part of the town. That's how it is today. Like, you, you can't think of Mio now without the bridge. Like, it's like thinking of Pisa without the Leaning Tower. It's brought a prosperity, it's brought a warmth, and it's become a destination in its own right because it is considered in the landscape a very beautiful object and literally driving across it, sometimes you're above the clouds. I just want to have the opportunity to design a bridge to do my best, and I'm very, very proud when I see that there are thousands of visitors every day in summer at Mio. The role that Britain had in leading the Industrial Revolution in the world was very important part in Britain becoming a leading proponent of bridge design. Britain was the first place where people had designed big bridges, so what we wanted Mio to be was a celebration of what can be achieved today at the, at the turn of the millennium 
using the methods, the design technology, the computer tools, the materials and the construction techniques. It's a celebration of what we can do today and I think we've achieved that. There are very, very few places untouched by some kind of human presence. We all need the wilderness and there are areas which should be protected. But when there is that inevitability, then the challenge, the question is, can we do it in a way which respects nature and at the same time becomes something to celebrate? British engineers and designers have a long, successful history with record-breaking bridges. From the Sky Bridge in Scotland to the Mior Viaduct in France, we continue to be at the forefront of the most innovative superstructures in the world, demonstrating how the best bridges go beyond functionality to be so much more. Yeah.